Greetings from my world. What is up with y'all niggas, man? We're back in a reaction. And today we got Neighborhood Killer Does the Unthinkable. Mr. Ballin. Without further ado, like, comment, and subscribe. Let's jump right into it, nigga. Gang, gang. Our stories typically have really big plot twists at the end, and today's story is no different. However, the plot twist today is so unexpected, so abrupt, so shocking, so horrifying, that I thought it would be interesting if you all tried to guess the ending as you're watching it, and you put your guesses in the comments section, and then we'll see if anybody comes even remotely close to what the ending actually is. Yeah, this shit gonna be crazy. Honest, I don't think anybody is gonna guess this one. But before we get into that story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place because it's a long ass we video and too. we upload once a week. So if that's of interest to you, please change the fourth song on the like button's sleep playlist to the loudest heavy metal death music you can possibly find. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. Okay, let's get into today's story. Yeah, man, it's like a 36 uh, minute long video. It's going to be a long ass reaction, dog. But we here for it. Grinding, nigga. Shout out to my 29th subscriber. I fuck with y'all heavily. In the late summer of 1930, Rafael Pansardi and his wife Leonardo Cianciulli moved with their four young kids to a little town in northern Italy called Correggio. A terrible earthquake had destroyed the family's previous village and killed nearly all of their neighbors. And so this family was feeling very lucky to be alive, but when they arrived in Correggio, they really had nothing and were hoping that, you know, the people of this town will just be very welcoming and generous and kind of help them get set up again. And the people of this town did exactly that. Correggio was this beautiful place inside of a fertile valley where people lived in these cottages surrounded by rice fields and mulberry trees. And the people who lived there were very tight knit and looked after each other and cooked for each other and had parties together. Right, so I mean, this was nice a community. Real community. And so when Raphael and Leonardo arrived, the townspeople immediately found them this cute little cottage by a stream with a whitewashed front door and a beautiful stone hearth for cooking, and there was an attached storefront on this cottage that they were giving them. And then on top of that, once the family had moved in, the family's new neighbors helped get Raphael a job, and they also helped Leonardo set up the attached storefront that was part of their cottage so she could sell her homemade soap bars this out was of being the Italy. shop. And so very quickly, the family just completely fell in love with Correggio, especially 36-year-old Leonardo. Losing her home and her previous neighbors in that terrible earthquake had been a tragedy on epic scale, but it was far from the first tragedy that Leonardo had been forced to live through. Leonardo had been born into poverty. Her mother had actually come from a very wealthy family, but they had cut Leonardo's mom off when she became pregnant with Leonardo. And so when Leonardo's mom gave birth to her, she blamed Leonardo for their poverty and all of their problems, and so beat her relentlessly. Oh, and then on top no, of that, nigga. Leonardo's father died when she was very young, and so she was stuck at home being abused constantly by her mother. Uh, when Leonardo drama. was 21, she met Raphael and fell in love with him, and he was a very kind and gentle man. He really made a very strong first impression on anyone who met him. But when Leonardo went to her mother and introduced Raphael to her and said, I'm going to marry this man, I love him, her mother flew into a rage and then literally cursed Leonardo. She actually out loud muttered the spell and then told Leonardo that because of the spell, Leonardo would have evil following her forever. Now, of course, Leonardo was very used to her mother's terrible behavior, and so she did not actually think she was at risk of this curse affecting her life in right, any way. Right. But not long after actually marrying Raphael, Leonardo began to see evidence that this curse might actually be real. It started with Leonardo having these sudden fits of seizures for no particular reason. And then Leonardo, every time she got pregnant, she would miscarry and lose the baby. And so feeling really sad and desperate because all she wanted was a family, Leonardo actually went to a fortune teller in hopes that they would tell her that in the future, her life 
got better, not worse, which to Leonardo meant, you know, the curse was not real if my life improves. But after this fortune teller took Leonardo's hands and studied her palms, she looked up at Leonardo and gave her grave news. She said, Leonardo, you're going to have living children, but they're all going to die young. Damn. And I see a prison and an insane asylum in your future. This experience totally shocked Leonardo and confirmed for her that her mother's curse. If a fortune teller told me that shit, I'd be bitter for the rest of my life. I would be bitter as hell. I probably wouldn't have kids, nigga. If I knew that, why, why even have kids at that point? If they're going to die young type shit. I'd be a bitter ass nigga if I... If, if that was my future, though, I'd be a bitter ass nigga, bro. Must be real. And sure enough, over the following years, Leonardo and Raphael would go on to have 14 living children. 14? And God 10 damn. of them would die when they were babies or toddlers. And so by the time Leonardo had arrived in Correggio with her family in 1930, she was absolutely petrified that her last four precious children would die because of this curse. And so in order to keep her kids safe, she basically never let them out of her sight. And then she also made sure Very they protective. always adhered to these strange rules and beliefs that Leonardo had come up with about good and evil that were designed to somehow protect the kids from this curse. But but the incredible show of generosity and support and kindness that Leonardo and her family had experienced when they arrived in Correggio had really done something to Leonardo. In fact, it really kind of changed the way she viewed the world. Suddenly, she was less concerned with this curse and how to protect her family from it. And instead, she was just kind of content. She felt safe. She felt happy. The women in the town loved Leonardo and always came by the house to say hi to her and eat some of the amazing tea cakes that she would make. And also Leonardo had become best friends with this woman named Virginia, who was a former opera singer from Milan, who was very elegant and beautiful. And every time she went to a mm. dinner party, she would invite Leonardo. And also Leonardo and her family were becoming financially stable really for the first time ever. Leonardo's soap shop that she ran out of their cottage was really successful. People came from all around to buy her soaps because nobody could make them like she could. And Raphael's job as a clerk was very steady and he too was becoming well respected in town. Right, and so right. because of how well this transition to Correggio had been, at some point Leonardo made a promise both to herself and to the universe that instead of focusing all of her time and energy on this curse which had plagued her her whole life, instead she was going to focus on helping the people of of Correggio any way she could because they had done so much for her. And that is exactly what Leonardo did, but in a kind of ironic way. Because of the fear Leonardo had for her mother's curse, she had gone to that fortune teller many years ago. And even though the news she got when she saw the fortune teller was horrible, Leonardo had left that experience kind of fascinated with the art of fortune telling and magic and sorcery. It just really appealed to her. Mm. And so now that Leonardo was running this very successful soap shop out of her house, there were all these people coming from far and wide that would ask to barter for her soaps. Bartering is like trading one item for another item versus paying for something outright with money. And so yeah, yeah. Leonardo began bartering with these travelers whenever they had books about fortune telling, about magic, about sorcery, about how to make potions, about the occult. And yeah, this sounds like some weird ass like Harry Potter sorcery shit. Now she now she uh fucking interested in these all this sorcery shit, this wizard weird shit. Yeah, bro. Some Something bad for to happen. It's only a matter of time. After reading through all of these books and learning as much as she could, Leonardo, in addition to selling her soaps, began offering fortune telling services to the people of Correggio. And it would turn out she was really good at predicting the future to the point where people in town basically began going to her for all kinds of advice. She helped women find love. She told farmers what crops to plant. She created these charm bags for people and told them they would protect them. She also began creating these herbs 
were potions for people when they got sick. It actually got to the point where people trusted her so much that when they got sick, they didn't even go to the doctor. They just went to her. And so very quickly, Leonardo felt very proud of the fact that she had lived up to the promise she had made both to herself and to the universe to always help the people of Correggio at every turn. But more than that, Leonardo was starting to think that this newfound sense of purpose and happiness she was getting in helping the people of Correggio through her various services had finally broken her mother's curse. By 1939, Leonardo and her family had been living in Correggio very happily for almost 10 years. And okay, at okay. the time, Leonardo's oldest son, Giuseppe, was 17 years old. Giuseppe mm. was tall, he was handsome, he had dark hair, he had dark eyes, and all the girls loved him. And Giuseppe and Leonardo had always had a very close relationship. Every day, Giuseppe would come home, and he and his mom would sit in the kitchen, and they would chat for a while and eat some of her tea cakes. But now, in 1939, when Giuseppe was 17, he started to act a little bit different. He would come home, and instead of going into the kitchen to sit with Leonardo, he would just go straight to his room and shut the door. And when Leonardo or and Raphael would ask him, you know, hey, is everything okay? Giuseppe would get very defensive and say he was fine and to please just leave me alone. But to Leonardo, it seemed really obvious that her son was not fine, and she- Hey, that's a mother's instinct though, for real, like, like even as even as a dad kind of like if, if you know your child is not them like not themselves you know that shit but there is no doubt in your mind well, maybe i'm just tripping now you know that shit so a mother's instinct is real powerful they know when something is wrong with their child bro they know it <laughs> they know it you know, maybe he has some sort of secret he's keeping, and that's what's making him act this way. He's hurting on the inside, but he can't share it with the world. But Leonardo had no idea what this secret might be. And then one day, late that same year, Leonardo was walking through town when one of her neighbors came up to her and said, hey, are you aware that your son Giuseppe has signed up for the military and he's leaving for training in just a few months? Leonardo had not heard about this. People were talking a lot about World War II, which had just started around this time, but Leonardo had never considered that her precious son would go off to fight in that war. But now, Leonardo realized that Giuseppe's recent strange behavior suddenly made sense. This was the secret he was keeping. The, uh, he had joined the military the and he hadn't told his story? family. Leonardo turned around and went straight home. She went right into her bedroom, shut the door, and she just sobbed. To her, it felt like her mother's curse was back. And now her precious son was going to go off into the war and he was going to die. Unless she found a way to combat this evil that was now following her again. For the next several days, Leonardo did not open up her soap shop. She didn't come downstairs. She just stayed locked in her bedroom and read through all oh, yeah, of her books about it. magic and sorcery and the occult, looking for some sort of solution for how to fight this curse. And finally, she figured out what she had to do. She read that if she gave something beautiful to the universe, the universe would reward her. And in Leonardo's mind, that reward would be sparing her son. And so Leonardo decided that the most beautiful thing she could offer the universe would be to help the people of Correggio, which she was already doing, but in her mind, she thought she could really ramp up her efforts and really try to change people's lives. And she thought if she could do that, the universe was sure to notice and it would save her son's life. Leonardo decided that the first person she would really go above and beyond to help inside of Correggio was a woman named Faustina. Faustina, who was in her 70s, was desperate to get married, but to many people in town, including Leonardo, she seemed kind of beyond help. She was totally antisocial, she was awkward, <coughs> and just kind of given her age, it seemed like marriage was just not in the cards for her. But this is where Leonardo thought she could step in and change everything for Faustina. She would find her a husband. So Leonardo reached out. Listen, and here's the thing about that, bro. You can't satisfy everybody. You can't give everybody what they need, what they want. You can't help everybody, dog. It's impossible to make everybody happy. It's impossible to help everybody. You got to help yourself before you help somebody else, dog. So all that helping shit. You can help a lot of people, but you can't help everybody. It's just, it's just, it's not realistic. It's never going to happen. 
Can't help everybody, my nigga. Austina and told her about a friend of hers, a man who lived in a city to the north, who was also alone in his old age and who was likely looking for marriage, and she could set them up if Faustina was interested. And so Faustina was immediately interested and wanted to meet this guy, but Leonardo did tell her that, you know, this guy, the reason he's not married is he's kind of difficult to be around, he's kind of a jerk, but he's got a wonderful heart, he means well, I think he'd be a great fit for you. And so again, Faustina's like, great, I want to meet him, I want to marry him i'm ready and then finally the day oh, came when faustina actually went to this other town and met this guy in person and they fell in love and faustina just moved right in with him and huh. before long she was sending happy postcards back to correggio telling everyone about how, how happy she last? was and how thankful she was for leonardo's help in setting them up and so leonardo was obviously thrilled not only for her friend's happiness but also it really felt like she had checked the box in terms of really good going above and beyond to help someone in Correggio in an effort to get the universe to spare her son. But her son was still a couple months away from leaving for training, and Leonardo, she's very superstitious, and she's thinking, okay, I don't know if that was enough to get the universe to save my son, and so I need to find somebody else I can help. So, in September of 1940, Leonardo began her next good deed project with another woman in town. She was a widow in her 50s named Francesca. She had worked as a teacher, but when her husband got sick, she quit her job, and then when her husband ultimately died, she was left with nothing. So, Leonardo reached out to Francesca and told her that she, Leonardo, would be willing to reach out to her own mother's rich family to see if maybe they had a job they could finesse for Francesca. Now, of course, Leonardo was not excited about talking to her mother's family, who had disowned her mother and had shown no interest in Leonardo, but right, right. Leonardo wanted to do this for Francesca and for the sake of her son and getting the universe to notice what she was doing. And so sure enough, Leonardo would reach out to her mother's family, and they were remarkably open to the idea, and they got a job for Francesca in Switzerland. And so eventually, Francesca jetted off to Switzerland, and then a couple of days later, she was sending postcards back to Correggio, saying how happy she was and how thankful she was for Leonardo's help. And so again, Leonardo was so happy about this outcome, both because she cared about Francesca, and also because this was yet another kind of check in the box of her good deeds that the universe was going to notice that in turn would save her son. But again, after Francesca didn't need any more help, Leonardo found herself looking at her son, who was getting closer and closer to leaving for training, and she would think to herself, have I done enough to protect him? Have I Probably really not. stopped this curse from killing him after he leaves? And Leonardo eventually decided that no, she had not done enough. She needed to do at least one more really big good deed for someone in this town. And who better to help than her best friend, Virginia, the former opera singer. Leonardo knew from all her talks with Virginia that Virginia really missed living in the big city and going to the opera house. And so I'm really intrigued to see how this story ends, bro, because it, it just it just seems like a bad idea helping all these people out, bro. Like, I know something bad is going to happen, some big plot twist, something's going to happen, bro, that's going to blow my fucking mind. Like, I'm really intrigued to see the ending, I'm not gonna lie. Leonardo reached out to Virginia and said, you know what, I can reach out to my mother's rich family and maybe they can find a job for you in a big city if you're interested. And so Virginia was like, wow, yes, I would love that. That's an amazing opportunity. And so Leonardo again would contact her mother's rich family and again they came through, finding this job as a social planner for this very rich guy in Florence, Italy, who often funded plays this shit, beautiful. And Operas. And so this job was perfect for Virginia. When Leonardo told Virginia about this opportunity, Virginia cried tears of joy. After packing up all of her things, Virginia made a stop at Leonardo's house to say goodbye and thank you. And the two women would hug and laugh and cry. They would drink wine together. And then finally, when it was time for Virginia to go, even though Leonardo was very sad, she was also quite happy because finally she felt like this good deed was enough to get the universe to spare her son. However, 
Leonardo, being a very superstitious person, did have one more little thing she wanted to do with Giuseppe before he left uh, for the military. She doing too and much. this little thing was her, Leonardo, bathing her son, her 18-year-old son, with a particular bar of soap, and then she also wanted to feed him a special kind of tea cake that she was going to make. The soap and the tea cake had these special herbs and ingredients and different things she had pulled from her books of magic and the occult, and they would kind of form like a protective barrier both outside and inside of Giuseppe. So on the same night that Virginia headed off to Florence, when Giuseppe came home, Le I mean, I, under I understand though, she's trying to protect her son and shit because of this curse that was put on her. I understand, do what you have to do, but like, I don't know, I just feel like something bad is gonna happen, my nigga. Like, I just feel like she doing too much, you feel me? Narda approached him and said, I want to give you this bath and I want to feed you these tea cakes. And Giuseppe was not remotely enthused at the idea of having his mom bathe him. He's 18. But he knew she was highly superstitious. She seemed pretty emotional about this. And it just seemed like it was extremely important to her. And so he said, okay. And so Leonardo washed her son with this special kind of magic soap. And then she also gave him the tea cakes. And then afterward, even though Giuseppe was really annoyed by what he had just been asked to do, Leonardo was so happy she was practically floating. She felt like she had done everything she could possibly do. And now she could just relax because her son was safe. But soon, Leonardo would learn that that nah. was not actually true. A few days <laughs> after giving her son the magical last bath and magical tea cakes, the police showed up at the front door of Leonardo's house. Oh, shit. And when she opened the door and saw the police, she asked what was going on. And the police would say to her, hey, the three women that you supposedly helped that they left did. town recently, they did. they've all been reported missing by their families. They don't know where they are. And Damn. so Leonardo, she was totally shocked by this. And she she said, no, that's that's not possible. I write to them all the time. I, I get postcards that come in very regularly from all of them. And then Leonardo went and got the postcards and showed the police, like, look, I'm talking to them. How could they possibly be missing? And so the police, they would look at these letters and they would agree with Leonardo that it is pretty strange that she'd be getting these very authentic seeming letters from these women if these women were also missing. Yeah, that's weird. And so eventually the police would leave and they would tell Leonardo that they would be in touch if they needed anything and then over the next couple of days Leonardo was very concerned about these three women but she received numerous postcards from these women over those several days and all of these postcards were totally normal seeming and so Leonardo was fairly confident that whatever was going on with the police had to have been a mix-up and she wouldn't be hearing from them again but a couple of weeks later the police did come back to Leonardo's house except this time they didn't knock they just barged right in. God After damn. the police had spoken with Leonardo that first time, they did some digging on these letters that she was receiving, and they managed to trace them all back to their start point. And it turned out all of these letters from all three of these women were originating from one place. It was this little town to the north of Correggio. And when police went to this little town, they discovered that these letters that were starting in this little town were all being mailed by the same person and they got a physical description of this person who apparently was pretending to be these three women. Oh, and the description shit. was of a tall, handsome young man with dark hair and- It's that, it's that bitch's son. What's that nigga name? Giuseppe? I, bro, I knew it. Go go back, go back early in my, uh, in my reaction, bro. I said, I said it, bro. He's the villain, he's the killer, bro. He, because I, I just knew it, my nigga, I just knew it. That's crazy, nigga. Oh, I knew that nigga was up to no good. I knew that nigga was up to no good. Dark eyes. It was Giuseppe. Yeah. After the police barged into Weird Leonardo's house, they went straight to Giuseppe's room where they accused him of murdering those three women. And then they hauled him out of the house and brought him to the station to question him about where he dumped the bodies. When the last police officer left Leonardo's house, Leonardo walked outside and just stood there wondering what she was going to do. It was like she had done everything in her power to protect her son from this curse. But somehow this curse she knew had done this 
was to her son. And so now she knew there was only one thing she could do. Without saying anything to her husband, she went inside, she got her things, and she began making her way to the police station. At this point in her life, Leonardo looked much older than her actual age of 46. She had very gray hair, her face was very wrinkled, and she was stooped over, and she was always carrying these charm bags and magical potions and little stick figures that she claimed protected her family. And so her overall appearance when she wandered into the police station was that of a very frail old woman who was also very strange. And so Leonardo hobbled her way up to the front desk and in a trembling voice, she asked the attendant if she could speak to the detective who was working on her son's case. And then a moment later, she was led into an interview room where she was told to wait. And then a little while later, the lead detective walked into the room. He sat down across the table from Leonardo and he said, what can I do for you? And immediately Leonardo said, my son Giuseppe is innocent. And the detective, when he heard this, he was not remotely surprised. In fact, this is fully what he expected this conversation was going to be. This be another he plot knew twist. Leonardo loved her son very much, and of course she was going to say he was innocent. This is what parents typically did in no, cases it's deeper like than this. That. It's but deeper than the detective that. decided he wouldn't try to stop her. He would just let this very distraught mother kind of talk for a bit. He would tell her that he would follow up on whatever she was saying, and then he would drive her back home. But this detective was not expecting the things that would come out of Leonardo's mouth over the next couple of hours. In fact, her story about why Giuseppe was innocent was so shocking and so bizarre that the detective outright said, I don't believe you. I don't believe this. This can't be true. And then other officers were called in to listen no, to her crazy. story it's, it's to really see good. if they believed it. And they too said, it's this doesn't good. seem real. But the police would follow up on the details she gave, and it all checked out. It would turn out back in late 1939 on the day that Faustina, the first woman that Leonardo pledged to help in order to get the universe to save her son, when Faustina was set to go north and meet her future husband, Faustina stopped by Leonardo's house to say bye. And when she was in Leonardo's house, something very unexpected happened. When Faustina walked into Leonardo's kitchen where Leonardo was, Faustina was so excited about meeting her potential future husband that her hands were shaking and she was smiling ear to ear. And so Leonardo said to Faustina, hey, you need to calm down. Yeah, and so season. she handed Faustina a glass of wine. And so Faustina took the wine and she had a couple of sips of wine. And right away, Faustina started feeling dizzy. And before long, she was grabbing the table just to keep from falling over. Over, it would turn out the that's, wine was poisoned yeah, that's by like poison. Leonardo. Yeah. And so Damn. Faustina, she's kind of looking up at Leonard. Damn. So it was that bitch. I'm super confused now. So it was that bitch. He poisoned. That's crazy, bro. That is crazy. Nigga. <laughs> bro. And Leonardo is looking down at her, and she's got an axe in one of her hands. You fucking and whore. She says to Faustina. I'm so sorry. And then she winds up and she strikes Faustina in the chest with the axe and lodges it in her chest. And so she lets go of it, expecting Faustina to die. She doesn't. Faustina's just standing there with an axe in her chest. And so Leonardo grabbed the handle of the axe. She pulled it out of her chest and then began wailing on her head over and over and oh over God. again until Faustina did fall to the ground dead. Then Leonardo lit a fire under her big metal pot on the stove, and then she cut Faustina's body into nine pieces. She drained the blood out of the body into a bucket, and then she chucked those nine pieces into the pot on the stove and began to mix them with caustic soda, which Crazy is a powerful dissolving agent that's used to make soap. And then she boiled the ingredients, her body parts and this caustic soda for hours. Faustina's body slowly turned into this horrible black mush inside of this pot and Leonardo was watching this the whole time and she just had a look of total disappointment as this was happening and then at some point she just took the pot off the stove and dumped the ingredients Faustina's body down the septic so what I'm getting from this is she's trying she's killing these people because she's trying to save her son that's what I'm getting from this oh you crazy ass bitch you fucking whore and what's crazy is I didn't even know it was her bro I thought it was her son. It was like, I was like, damn. But then I was thinking like, nah, that's too easy, bro. Now, bro, that's crazy. It's her? 
Bro, oh my goodness. This is why I love missing Bobby. This is why I love this And then this Leonardo nigga. waited for Faustina's blood that she had dumped out to coagulate, which means it became semi-solid. And then she heated it up in the oven and then ground it into flour. And she would use that flour to make tea cakes, which she fed to her friends the next day, oh as well as God. her son, Giuseppe. Leonardo also asked her son to mail some letters for her from the little town to the north where Faustina had supposedly gone. These letters, of course, were written by Leonardo pretending to be Faustina to give the impression that she was still alive and well. And she Giuseppe, when he was told shit. to go mail these letters, didn't think anything of it. He was used to doing errands for his mom. Even though Leonardo basically got away with killing Faustina, her plan for Faustina had not really gone the way Leonardo had hoped. When she boiled Faustina's chopped up body parts and this caustic soda, they didn't really mix the way she wanted them to. Leonardo was convinced that the reason for this is because Faustina was too skinny, and so there wasn't enough fat on her body for the mix to be perfect. So Leonardo had come up with another elaborate story, this time for another woman, Francesca, about that job in Switzerland she, she got through her mother's rich family. Rest of course, peace. none of that was true, and when Francesca came by Leonardo's house to say goodbye to her, she was offered a glass of poisoned wine, and after she sipped from it, she became dizzy, and then Leonardo showed up with an axe and hacked Francesca to death. But again, when the body parts and the caustic soda were Didn't in the mix. pot on the stove boiling together, they were still not coming together the way Leonardo wanted. And so again, Leonardo, with a look of disgust, just dumped the pot down the septic tank and wound up making tea cakes from Francesca's blood. Then the next day, she fed those tea cakes to her friends, as well as Giuseppe, and she also asked Giuseppe to send a few more letters from up north. I mean, you fucking disgusting. You fucking, you fed human meat to your fucking son and to your, oh my goodness, bro. You fucking, yeah, you're disgusting. Bitch, you're disgusting. You low down, dirty ass bitch. These letters were, of course, from to your own son. Still feeling totally unsatisfied with how the last two killings had gone, Leonardo moved on to her third target, her best friend, Virginia. Your best friend. And this friend. time, oh, when Virginia bitch. came by Leonardo's house to say goodbye, everything went to plan. Leonardo was able to poison Virginia. She killed her with the axe. She chopped her up. She put her in the pot. And this time, the nine chunks of her body mixed beautifully with the caustic soda. And so after adding a few fine perfumes into the pot, Leonardo was finally able to create the thing that she had not been able to create they, they with the other two women's bodies. <laughs> and that was a beautiful, rich, creamy bar of soap. She also, oh again, God. made tea cakes from Virginia's blood. That night, when Giuseppe came home, Leonardo demanded that she be allowed to bathe him with her magic soap, i.e. the soap made from Virginia's body. And so she did that. She scrubbed him with Virginia's body soap. The and then while she was doing that, she fed him the tea cakes that were made from Virginia's blood. It would turn out Leonardo did in fact believe that in order to save her son from this curse, she would need to give something beautiful to the universe. And at first, she really had believed that the way to do that was by helping the people of Correggio above and beyond anything she had ever done before. But at some point during her interactions with Faustina, the first woman, Leonardo had decided that, you know what, that wasn't enough. She really needed to make sure that her son was going to be safe. And so the only way really that Leonardo could guarantee her son would be safe would be if she actually took a life and gave that back to the universe. That would save her son. The reason Leonardo wound up... What logic is that? So you giving back to the universe is you thinking killing somebody. What logic is that? That is the complete opposite, bro. Get the fuck out of here. You're crazy, bitch. Making three You're lives done. and not just one life is because she also decided that as an extra protective measure, she wanted to make sure that she actually bathed her son, literally, in the body parts and kind of essence 
of the life she had taken. And so that's where the idea of the oh, soap that bitch came. Is crazy. However, the first two women, their body parts didn't mix right, and so she couldn't turn them into soap. But then Virginia came along and her body did mix with the caustic soda. And so Leonardo was able to make her soap. She was able to bathe her son with Virginia's body and this is feed disgusting. Him Virginia's blood. And so in Leonardo's mind, she had done everything she could to protect her son at that point. Leonardo would ultimately be sentenced to 30 years in prison, the bitch as well got as life. three years in an insane asylum, just as the fortune teller had predicted. Leonardo died in 1970 when she was 76 years old. As for her family, they fled Correggio and three of her children changed their names and she, I would too. And her prized son, Giuseppe, who she had killed to protect, had gone on to join the military and he would go to war and he either was killed in combat Combat or simply changed his name and vanished as well. So, uh, don't know what happened here. So, that's gonna do it. If you got something out of today's episode and you haven't done this already, please go in to the like button sleeping playlist. But yeah, man, that's gonna end this video, bro. What the fuck? That bitch was crazy, nigga. You did all that crazy ass shit just to protect your son. And you ain't, we don't even know what happened to him at the end of the day. He could have been killed or changed. I mean, what the fuck, bro? So you still failed. Man, bro, this is why you got to watch out for people. I know this happened back in the 30s and 40s, whatever, but you, the same shit still holds up today. Watch out. Watch out. Like, be weary of the people you hang around with, bro, because you never know what somebody is trying to do behind the scenes. You never know. I mean, she... Boiled the body parts, man. Get the fuck out of here, bro. That shit crazy, nigga. And that fortune tell was right every single time. That's crazy. Fortune, hey, that shit is real as hell. That shit is real, my nigga. But yeah, man. Shout out to Mr. Ballin. Another great story in the books. Best storyteller on YouTube, on the internet, hands down. But I'm gonna get the fuck up out of here. I'll see y'all boys in the next video. Peace.